Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, if your brains are not already overstuffed, we have Grant Jenks here to teach you all about Python sorted collections. Take it away. Thanks. So I'm here today to talk about Python sorted collections. I'm excited and a bit nervous to be up here in front of all you smart people, but I'm a pretty smart guy myself, and I really admire Python. So let's get started. Every time I talk about sorted collections, my wife here, Sorted, we'll see today how many times I can confuse the on-site captioners. You're probably more familiar with sorted collections than you realize. Let me make a short argument for sorted collection types. In the standard library, we have heap queue, bisect, and queue.priority queue, but none of those quite fill the gap. Behind the scenes, priority queue actually uses a heap implementation. And another common mistake is to think that collections.orderedDict is a dictionary that maintains sort order, but that's not the case. I don't always import sorted types, but when I do, I expect them in the standard library. And here's why. Java, C++, and .NET have them. Python has broken into the top five of the Tyobi index, but feels a bit more like PHP or JavaScript in this regard. We also depend on external solutions. So we have SQLite in-memory indexes. We have pandas.dataframe indexes and Redis sorted sets. If you've ever issued a zadd command to Redis, then you've used a sorted collection. So what should the API of sorted collection types be in Python? Well, I think a sorted list should be a mutable sequence, pretty close to the list API. There should also be a sort order constraint that must be satis satisfied by the set item and insert methods. I think it should also support a key argument like the sorted built-in function. And given sorted order, it seems right to add functions like bisect right and bisect left. You can also imagine an add method and a discard method for elements, kind of like a multi-set in other languages. I'd also expect get item, contains, count, et cetera, to be faster than linear time, right? We should take advantage of the fact that our data is sorted. A sorted dictionary should be a mutable mapping, probably pretty close to the dictionary API. But when we iterate a sorted dictionary, we should yield items in sorted order. We should also support efficient positional indexing. So while we have a keys view and an items view and a values view, for, sort, for a dictionary, I think a sorted dictionary would also add something like a sequence view. Again, sorted set, a lot like a mutable set. This is just building off the collections.abc uh, module. So these are abstract base classes. If you're not familiar, it's pretty close to the set API. And a sorted set should also kind of behave like a sequence. So something like the tuple API to support efficient positional indexing. The chorus and the refrain from core developers is, look to the PyPy. And that's pretty good advice. So let's talk about your options and do a bit of software archaeology in the process. BList is the genesis of our story. And it wasn't really designed for sorted collections, but that's what we have. BList is written in C. And the innovation here is really something called the BList data type. BList is a B tree implementation for C Python's built-in list. The sorted list, sorted dictionary, and sorted set were built on top of this B list data type, and it became the incumbent to B. Also noteworthy is that the API was rather well thought out. There were some quirks, however. For example, the pop method of a sorted list in B list actually returns the first element in the list rather than the last element as we're used to. Next up is sorted collection. Uh, this shows up in about 2010. This is actually a recipe from Raymond Hedinger, one of the core developers of Python. And I include it in large part because it's linked from the Python docs themselves. So this is, in many ways, the recommended solution. There's a couple innovations here. The first is it's simple. It's written in pure Python. And one of the other things he does is he maintains a parallel list of keys. So there's a key function support. We have a parallel list of keys for looking up, say, uh, an item by its key. 
This is Bin Trees. It's still alive and kicking today. A few innovations again here. It's written with Cython support to improve performance. And it has a few different tree backends. You can create a red, black, or AVL tree depending on your needs. There's also some notion of accessing the nodes themselves and customizing the tree traversal to slice by value rather than by index. Banyan had a very short life, but adds another couple innovations. It's incredibly fast. Uh, it achieves that through C++ template metaprogramming, so it's maybe not the best candidate for C Python. But it has uh, also this feature called tree augmentation that will let you store metadata at tree nodes, so you can actually use Banyan to implement interval trees if you need that. Finally, there's skip list collections. Couple significant things here. It's pure Python, so that's good. It's fast, even for large collections. So where sorted collection from Raymond slows down around 10,000 elements, skip list collection will perform reasonably well up to millions of elements. And I think it's also significant that this is not a tree-based implementation. This is actually a skip list data type rather than a binary tree. Altogether, this is the impression you get from PyPy. You try and figure it out, and it really, it kind of looks like a mess. PyPy, I think, has got to work better than using Google with the site operator, because that's the position I often find myself in. There's a couple others worth calling out here. Let's see if this works. So there's RB tree. That's also a very fast sorted dictionary implementation. You can see a couple here, treep. Uh, I don't know if you can read it, but there's a splay, there's a scapegoat tree. Those are uh, contributions by Dan Stromberg. He's done a number of experiments to see if he can find kind of the best tree implementation. Turns out there is no silver bullet when it comes to trees, so it's always going to depend a little bit on your use case. I love Python because there's one right way to do things. If I just wanted sorted types, what's the right answer? I couldn't find the right answer, so I built it. The missing battery, sorted containers. Here it is. This is the project homepage. If you go to Google and type in sorted containers right now, you'll probably get a PyPy reference. Scroll down, you'll find a link to the project homepage. Sorted containers is a Python sorted collections library with sorted list, sorted dictionary, and sorted set implementations. It's pure Python, but it's as fast as C extensions. It's Python 2 and Python 3 compatible. It's fully featured, and it's extensively tested with 100% coverage and hours of stress. Performance is a feature. That means graphs, lots of them. There are 189 performance graphs in total. I want to look at a few of them together. Here's the performance of adding a random value to a sorted list. I'm comparing sorted containers here with other competing implementations. So you'll see sorted list at the top. That's the sorted containers implementation. Then there's also a sorted list with key provided by sorted containers. Then there's B list. So B list has a couple of entries. And then there's sorted collection from Raymond. Notice also the axes here are log log. So if you have two major tick marks and difference, uh, the difference between two of the lines is a major tick mark, then one is actually 10 times faster than the other. And we see here that sorted containers is, in fact, about 10 times faster than BList when it comes to adding random values to a sorted list. Notice also Raymond's recipe, which is just a list, uh, displays this order n squared behavior. So that's why we get it curving up and to the left. Of all the sorted collections libraries, sorted containers is also the fastest at initialization, and we'll look at why pretty soon. Sorted containers is not always the fastest, but notice here the performance improves with scale. You can see it there in blue. So right here in the middle of the pack, we see sorted dictionary. This is deleting a key from a sorted dictionary. And with sorted dictionary, there's quite a few other competing implementations. So I'm including all of the other fastest ones I can find. 
as we scale upwards, so we're going from 100 elements up to a million elements, and we're adding a random value, sorted containers actually improve. So the slope of our blue line is less than the slope of these, uh, all of these are binary tree implementations with various balancing algorithms. In short, sorted containers is kind of like a B tree implementation. That means you can configure the fan out of nodes in the tree. So we call that the load parameter, and there are extensive performance graphs of three different load parameters. Here we see that a load factor of 10,000 is fastest for indexing into a sorted list, so that's about uh, twice as fast there. Notice how the axes now go up to 10 million elements, so many implementations can't handle that many, but sorted containers can. I've actually scaled sorted list all the way up to 10 billion elements. This was kind of an incredible experiment. I had to rent the largest high memory instance available from Google Compute Engine. Uh, and that benchmark required about 128 gigabytes of memory. Uh, it ran for 16 hours and it cost me about $30. This is the performance of deleting a key from a dictionary. Notice this time that uh, the smaller loads, a load of 10 or 100, is actually faster. The default is 1,000. You'll often find that's in the middle of the three. And it's a very sane default. So if you're not used to breaking out your profiler or uh, doing performance analysis, just leave that untouched, and it'll work extremely fast. In addition to comparisons and load factors, I also benchmark run times. Here's CPython 2.7. CPython 3.5 and PyPy version 5, you can see where the just-in-time compiler, the JIT compiler, kicks in. There's some JIT magic right there. Uh, that'll make sorted containers another 10 times faster. So because we're pure Python, we really scream when we have a Python JIT. I was really encouraged seeing Piston, uh, Pigeon, PyPy, all of those are great implementations, I think, moving in this direction of including a JIT for Python. Finally, I made a survey in 2015 on GitHub as to how people were using sorted collections. I noticed patterns like priority queues, multi-sets, nearest neighbor algorithms, et cetera. This is the priority queue workload, which spends about 40% of its time adding elements, 40% of its time popping elements out of the list, 10% of its time discarding elements, and has a couple other methods like iteration. In all of these workloads, sorted containers is two to 10 times faster than other implementations. We also have a lot of features. The API is nearly a drop-in replacement for the B-list and RB tree modules, which are quite popular. But the quirks have been fixed, so now the pop method returns the last element, as I think you would expect. Sorted lists are sorted, so you can bisect them. That's what happens in the second line here. Looking up the index of an element is very fast. Bin trees introduced methods for tree traversal, and I've boiled those down to a couple API methods. On line three, we see an iRange method. iRange iterates all keys from Bob to Eve in sorted order. So this allows us to create an iterator to iterate by value rather than by index. Sorted dictionaries also have a sequence-like view called iloc. If you're coming from pandas, that should look familiar. It's I-L-O-C. Line four creates a list of the five largest keys in the dictionary. So that's my sequence view. Similar to iRange, there is an iSlice method. iSlice does positional index slicing. In line five, we create an iter iterator over the indexes 10 through 49 inclusive. One of the benefits of being pure Python is it's easy to hack on. Over the years, a few patterns have emerged and become recipes. All of these are available from PyPy with simply pip install sorted collections. If all that didn't convince you that sorted containers is great, then listen to what other smart people say about it. Alex Martelli says, good stuff. I like the simple, effective implementation idea of splitting the sorted containers into smaller fragments to avoid the order and insertion costs. Jeff Nupp writes, that last part, fast as C extensions, was difficult to believe. I would need some sort of performance comparison 
to be convinced this is true. The author includes it in the docs. It is. Kevin Samuel says, I'm quite amazed, not just by the code quality, it's incredibly readable and has more comment than code, wow, but the actual amount of work you put at stuff that is not code, documentation, benchmarking, implementation explanations, even the git log is clean and the unit tests run out of the box on Python 2 and 3. So if you're new to sorted collections, I hope I've piqued your interest. Think about the achievement here. Sorted containers is pure Python, but as fast as C implementations. So together I want to look under the hood of sorted containers at what makes it so fast. It really comes down to bisect for the heavy lifting. So bisect is a module in the standard library that implements binary search on lists. There's also a handy method called insort that does a binary search and insertion for us in one call. So if we had a value and a sorted list, we could simply insert that value into our sorted list by calling bisect.insort. There's really no magic here, it's just implemented in C and it's part of the standard library. So you get bisect for free. This is going to do all the heavy lifting for us. Here's the basic structure. It's a list of sublists. So this is a sorted list and it has the values 0 through 17 in it. There's a member variable underscore list that points to these sublists, and each of those is maintained in sorted order. So if you, if you know how a B tree works, you should start to see the B tree pattern. You'll sometimes hear me refer to these as the top level list and its sublists. So the top level list being underscore lists, and then its sublists being those that contain the actual elements. There's no need to wrap sublist in its own object, they're just lists. Simple is fast and efficient. In addition to the list of sublists, there's an index called the maxes index that simply stores the maximum value in each sublist. Now lists in C Python are simply arrays of pointers, so we're not adding much overhead with this index. So there's one pointer to the largest element in a sublist per thousand element. So it's pretty low overhead. Let's walk through testing membership with contains given these two elements. So if I wanted to know whether the number 14 is in my sorted list, I start by bisecting the maxes index. So if I bisect maxes, it'll give me the index where I should insert that element to maintain a sorted list. That'll be down here in position uh, three. That position corresponds to the sublist potentially containing the value I'm interested in. So then I again call bisect on this sublist, and if I bisect for the number 14, I'll get index number one. And then I can simply do a comparison to say, is that index in fact the element I'm looking for? So it's very quick to do a kind of contains operation. We simply call bisect twice, and this has the log n behavior that we're accustomed to seeing. Let's also walk through adding an element. Let's add five to the sorted list. So once again, we'll bisect our maxes index. That'll give us index one in the maxes index, which corresponds to a sublist. We'll bisect that sublist looking for, position, for element five. That'll again give us index one, so it tells us you should insert here. And we'll use that bisect.insort method in order to insert the element into the sorted list. Now, if you're watching carefully, you should notice that these lists could get really large. That's where the load factor comes in. So our default load factor is 1,000, meaning if we kept inserting elements into these sublists, when a sublist becomes twice the load factor in length, so if we grew these sublists to twice the load factor, like 2,000 elements, then we actually split the sublist in half and we insert two sublists in its place. Similarly, if a sublist actually shrunk to 500 elements, so half of the load, then we combine that sublist with its neighbor. So in that way, we're constantly keeping these sublists roughly balanced according to the load factor that was given during initialization. Now, numeric indexing is a little more complex. 
Numeric indexing uses a tree packed densely into another list. So if you have experience with heaps, think about a heap structure for a second. I haven't seen this exact structure described in textbooks or research. So for the time being, I like to call it a Jenks index. That's named after me. I'm a little vain. Um, I'll also refer to it as the positional index. So let's build this together. Starting from our list of, list of sublists, notice the lengths of each of these. So there's four elements in the first one, three elements in the next, then six elements here, and five here. We're simply going to map the len built in, the length built in, over all of those sublists in order to create a list of lengths. So that's a very fast operation. Then we're going to calculate the pairwise sums of those lengths. So here we're simply adding 4 and 3 to be 7 and 6 and 5 to be 11. We repeat this operation of calculating pairwise sums until we're left with only one element. So here our original lengths was four elements, our next pairwise sums was two elements, then we're getting down to one element. In order to build the positional index, we simply zip, we simply uh, chain all of these together. So our final index is 18, 7, 11, 4, 3, 6, 5. So we've taken something that's kind of like a tree and we've shoved it into a list because we forced that tree to be very dense, just like with a heap uh, data type. The offset is simply the length of all the uh, elements up until the lengths list. So here offset three counts one, two, three elements, and then here at index three is the start of our lengths list. So that lengths list gets copied directly into the Jenks index. Let's try an example with the positional index. Remember the positional index is a tree. So here I've actually written it kind of in the shape of a tree. There's 18, the node 18 is at the top. It has two children, seven and 11. And then each of those nodes has two children, seven having four and three, 11 having six and five. If we wanna look up index eight, we can traverse this tree to figure out how to do so. Starting at the root, which is node 18, we compare the index to the left child node. So we're gonna compare eight to seven. Eight is greater than seven. So what we do is we subtract seven from eight, which gives us now one, and we move to the right child node. So in step two here, we're moving to node 11. We decremented the index by the left child node, and we've now at position two in our index. So there's zero, one, two. We're gonna repeat this process. So now with uh, index one, we again look at the left child node, this time it's six. One is less than six, so we actually simply move to the left child node. And we can also detect now that we're at a leaf node. It's very easy to calculate these left and right child nodes. They're simply at n times two and n times two plus one. So it's just like a heap structure, but this is not a heap. This is a positional index. When we terminate at six, we're left with our index at one, the position in our positional index at five, and we can use that five to calculate the top level list index. So we're gonna do five minus that offset. So that's where offset comes back into play. If you were able to follow all that, you're left with two values. One is the top index, which is two, and one is the remaining index, which is one. Remember, we are interested in position eight. So let's look, did we get there? So two, so in the top level index, we're at zero, one, two, and then we're at index one within that. So there's eight. So the positional index is a way for us to very efficiently look up numerically uh, an element. This leads us to our first lesson. The built-in types are fast, like really fast. They're C. The built-in types are C code, and they benefit from years of operate, uh, optimizations. So as much as possible, use these C data types. Use these built-in types. 
Okay, let's look at the contains method for a sorted list. This is the majority of the code, honest. This is how simple it is. We bisect the max's index for a position. Then we bisect the sublist for another position. And then we test, is the element we found equal to the element you gave us? How many lines of Python code executed? Four. How many lines of C code executed? Possibly hundreds. In this way, I'm not quite programming Python so much as I'm programming my interpreter. I'm programming against the optimized libraries that I've been given. And in that way, I'm writing Python code, but it's almost like I'm writing C. So here's the lesson. Program your interpreter. These operations are incredibly fast. And again, they're implemented in C. This is why sorted containers is as fast as C implementations. If you uh, follow this rule, you will write C code in Python, which is much nicer than writing C code itself. Now let's talk about memory. This is very simplified, so my apologies to those who feel it's maybe grossly simplified. But notice this limited sizes in the memory cache hierarchy of your processor. You get like a dozen registers, you get kilobytes of L1 cache, you get megabytes of L3 cache, maybe. Most machines don't even have an L3 cache. And so you want to keep the overhead low. You need to keep related data packed together. Think about sorted containers for a moment. Each sublist will have one pointer to an element that you added. That's it. We have a maxes index, but that's literally a thousandth of the number of elements. That's barely anything. So our sublists add roughly one pointer per element, and that's actually 60%, 66% less memory than traditional binary tree implementations. So we're going to take advantage of this memory hierarchy really well. Let's also talk about the memory tiers. These have very different performance. Memory slows down by a factor of 1,000 times from registers to main memory. So that advertised price of memory lookups that Intel or AMD shows you is actually the average random lookup time. But that's only one common pattern. Sequential memory access patterns are so fast, you almost don't pay for them at all. The processor literally predicts the memory you'll need next and queues it up for you before you ask for it. So you almost get sequential accesses for free. Then there's also a pattern called data-dependent memory accesses. These happen when you follow pointers, they, uh, particularly when you follow a lot of pointers. It means that the next memory location is dependent on the current memory location. And this is typical in binary trees. Unfortunately, it's also really slow. It's as much as 10 times slower than random or sequential memory access. Let's think about adding elements again. An add calls bisect.insort. And bisect.insort does a binary search and then insert on the list. Here is the C code for insert in C Python, approximately. Notice it's entirely sequential memory accesses. So we're getting a lot of these shifts for free. We're just costing cycles to move things over. So if we had 1,000 elements in a list and we want to insert at position 0, then it'll cost, say, 1,000 cycles. Think also about the binary search process. Initially, we're kind of randomly jumping through memory, but then over time, we're narrowing down on one specific region. So that also improves our locality. By comparison, traditional binary trees use this data-dependent memory access as they repeatedly dereference de pointers for other nodes. And so we can sequentially shift 1,000 elements in memory in the time it takes to access a couple of binary nodes from DRAM. So memory is tiered, and caches are limited in size. This is also why the slope of the performance curve for sorted list was less than that for binary tree implementations. Remember back at that performance graph? At scale, binary trees do more data-dependent DRAM lookups than sorted containers. I said that initializing a sorted container is fast. Let's look at why. Here's the initializer for a sorted list. Notice it simply calls the sorted built-in 
and then chops up the result into sublists and initializes the max's index. So you pass in an iterable, we pass that off to the sorted built-in, we chop up the result according to the load, and then we initialize the max's index as simply the last element in each sublist. I think of this kind of as a cheat. What I'm doing here is I'm using the power of tim sort to initialize the container. And it turns out initialization is really common. It's quite frequent that we initialize large data types, large collections, and then we only make a few edits for them. And in those scenarios, sorted containers will work incredibly fast. Think about how long does it take to initialize already sorted data in this case? Well, tim sort is heavily optimized. So tim sort will literally make one linear pass over the iterable, copy that almost like a mem copy into the result, and then we're going to iterate that result and chop it up into these sublist chunks. So we're doing maybe uh, only two mem copy like operations, and those are incredibly fast with today's modern processors. Here's another cheat. When we add an element to a sorted set, I add it to both a set object and a sorted list. And this preserves the fast set membership in tests. Now, some purists will argue that hashing should not be necessary, and they are correct. But quite often, if you can define comparisons, you can probably define hash. And remember, we're solving real problems, not theoretical ones. If you can reuse the built-in types, then cheat and do it. So if you can, cheat. The way to make things faster is to do less work. There's really no way around that. Another cheat I've mentioned regards the positional index. If you don't need numerical lookups, don't build the index. And that's a very common scenario with sorted dictionaries. It's quite rare that people do numerical indexing. We use less memory and we run faster. When it comes to runtime complexity, here's the punchline. Ready? Adding random elements has an amortized cost proportional to the cube root of the container size. So we're talking about cube root n. That's an unusual runtime complexity, but it works quite well in practice. The surprising thing is that n stays relatively small. For example, if we create a billion integers in C Python, it will take more than 30 gigabytes of memory, which is already exceeding the limits of most machines. We've also seen that memory is expensive. Allocations are costly. In the common case, sorted containers allocates no more memory when adding elements. So we're optimizing that as well. If you're still doubtful about performance at scale, I encourage you, go read the project docs. I created a page very recently called Performance at Scale. You might have to search. There's a lot of links. It talks extensively about theory with benchmarks all the way up to 10 billion elements. So that's going to last us quite a few more years. A little PSA before I continue. If you claim to be fast, please, please, please do measurements. Measure, 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 and publish those measurements. I understand benchmarks can be misleading, but just show me that you measured it. Measure, measure, measure. Big O notation is not a substitute for benchmarks. Quite often, the constants and coefficients that are ignored in theory matter quite a lot in practice. So measure, measure, measure. This whole project, in fact, started with a measurement. I was timing how long it took to add an element to a B list, and I noticed that bisect.insert was actually faster for a list with 1,000 elements. It was so much faster, in fact, I thought, wow, I could do two inserts in a 1,000 element list and still be faster than B list. That thought eventually became the list of sublist implementation that we have today. So here's the performance lessons. The built-in types are fast. Program your interpreter. Avoid programming in Python. Memory is tiered. Cheat if you can. And measure, measure, measure. A couple closing thoughts. Everything related to sorted containers is under an open source Apache 2 license. Contributors are very welcome. Uh, we've started to create a little community kind of around sorted collections. I think it's interesting that, uh, to ask, you know, is this worth a PEP, a Python enhancement proposal? I'm personally a little on the fence, but I lean towards uh, being in favor. 
I think sorted collections would contribute to Python's maturity, but I don't know if any proposal could really survive the inevitable bike shedding. So far, my contribution is a pure Python implementation that's fast enough for most scenarios. Let me end with a quote from Mark Summerfield. Mark and a couple other authors have actually deprecated their modules in favor of sorted containers. And Mark says this, Python's batteries included standard library seems to have a battery missing. And the argument that we've never had it before has worn thin. It is time that Python offered a full range of collection classes out of the box, including sorted ones. Thanks for letting me share. Hey, thank you. Questions, anyone? Uh, let me come to you so everyone can hear your question. Okay. Hi, Grant. Great talk. A uh, quick question. Have you compared performance against the Java or C++ implementations or .NET? There's other languages. I have not. That would be an interesting project. Any expectations? Um, I think it will be pretty competitive. Python in general is fairly competitive. Remember, we're ultimately using sorted containers writing C code. So it wouldn't surprise me even if we were a little faster than Java until Java was able to kick in its JIT. Contributions welcome. So I suppose that the, in your sorted container, the, the types, they are all the same. What if uh, I build a uh, container with, uh, for example, numeric values like one, two, three, and then I add a string later like full bar, what will happen? Well, uh, you'll be constrained by your Python implementation or the Python standard. So in Python 2, if you mix types in a list and try and sort that list, uh, it will kind of break ties when there are different kinds of types itself. In Python 3, they made that into an error. So my hands are kind of tied when it comes to that. Sorted containers will likewise trigger an error if you try, try and compare different types. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, your, uh, that uh, Jinx index, it reminds me of the order statistics tree in uh, computer science. You know, you build a binary tree, and uh, you add an uh, extra field, which has the number of uh, nodes in this subtree. Right, it's very similar to that. I was actually teaching a lesson uh, on heaps to a student uh, when I realized, gee, these heaps are so fast. And the heap queue module in particular in Python is quite quick. I was like, wow, I, I wish I could leverage that same thing for positional index. Uh, and with a little whiteboarding later, uh, I came up with this kind of sublist length positional index tree. Yeah, thank you very much. Have you considered using the array um, of storage mechanism for um, minimizing memory? You talked about memory efficiency, but lists are notoriously inefficient. Um, mm -hmm. Is there another option? I started researching that. Uh, I don't know if you're the one who just opened that GitHub issue, but somebody had a very similar thought. Um, and I started researching that on the train uh, from PDX to, or from the airport to here. Uh, if I recall correctly, it would be a little tricky, but it wouldn't be too difficult. I, I, I haven't quite investigated it enough yet. My real solution in that case is to suggest PyPy. So PyPy, PyPy P -Y -P -Y, is an alternative implementation. Um, PyPy will actually take advantage of something called tagged pointers. So PyPy will stuff the integer inside the pointer itself. And this will realize a huge uh, benefit. So a lot of times, too, you know, when I was talking about those cache uh, locality problems and memory accesses, PyPy really screams on this stuff because it'll be able to optimize in those ways. So I would try PyPy, but if you can't do that, uh, talk to me afterwards. We can research. Anyone else? Is there any room for optimization on sort of frozen or somewhat frozen data types? 
Well, it turned out, I, I've thought about that problem, a, a frozen, uh, a frozen sorted list is just a tuple. Right. Uh, sorry, I meant more like frozen dict or that sort of thing. <laughs> well, as I've played with that, uh, I've done a couple of things. There is a way to get kind of a dictionary view out of a dictionary, but there's an old uh, C Python issue bug that I think kind of squashed that idea like, nah, we'll never need that. Uh, we could try and resurrect that to make it work on C Python. The other thing you could do if you're like really sold on this idea of a frozen dictionary is you can actually just use a tuple uh, and you can copy the C implementation kind of right out of C Python. So I can, t I can give you more details on that uh, later. It's a little awkward. It's certainly not as fast. But using a big tuple and then indexing into it, you'll only see maybe a 2 to 10x slowdown. So there's some trade-offs. Any more questions? Well, thanks again, Grant. All right, thank you.